Good evening, Dr. Phil here. Today we'll be discussing on anesthetic considerations in patients with myasthenia gravis and Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome. Regarding the physiology of normal excitation contraction coupling, kindly refer to the respective video. Link is provided in the video description below. With regards to myasthenia gravis, anesthetic considerations. MG is an autoimmune disease where antibodies are formed against the post-junctional acetylcholine receptor characterized by muscle weakness and fatigability. A reduction in effective receptors results in easy fatigability of muscles with repetitive exertion. Up to 80% of functional receptors are lost if patients have myasthenia gravis symptoms. There is potential for respiratory failure Post-operative ventilatory support may be required in up to 30% of subjects. There is potential bow bar weakness with aspiration risk. Patients with myasthenia gravis are sensitive to non-depolarizing neuromuscular blockers. Initial doses and subsequent maintenance doses should be one-tenth of normal. Propofol and remifentanil technique may allow avoidance of neuromuscular blockade. In patients with myasthenia gravis, they are resistant to saxamethonium. Higher dose of saxamethonium at 2 mg per kg usually allows good conditions for intubation. Patients with mg may have thymoma and anterior mediastinal mass which poses a potential difficult intubation scenario. With regards to myasthenic crisis, this can be precipitated by various physical and emotional stresses or may be spontaneous Exacerbation of symptoms may be severe enough to cause respiratory failure. Cholinergic crisis. Excess acetylcholine stimulates muscarinic receptors and acts as a neuromuscular blocker at the diminished number of receptors. This leads to muscle weakness and respiratory compromise. Cholinergic crisis may be precipitated by an overdose of anticholine esterase. Reversal of non-depolarizing neuromuscular blockade with a normal dose of neostigmine is possible in MG, but this carries the risk of precipitating a cholinergic crisis. It is thus preferred to avoid the use of neostigmine by avoidance of non-depolarizing neuromuscular blockade, use of non-depolarizing neuromuscular relaxants, which are spontaneously broken down, such as atracurium and cisatracurium, use of rocuronium with reversal with sugamadex. Adrophonium. This is a drug that transiently improves a myasthenic but transiently worsens a cholinergic crisis. Adrophonium is a short-acting anticholine esterase which lasts for about 5 minutes and reversibly binds to the anionic and esteretic sites of acetylcholine esterase and renders the enzyme incapable of catalyzing the breakdown of acetylcholine. The short duration of action is accounted for by the relative instability of adrophonium acetylcholine esterase complex. Adrophonium has a diagnostic rather than a treatment role in the management of myasthenia gravis. For further details of adrophonium and neostigmine, kindly refer to the video discussing neuromuscular blockade reversal agents. Autoimmune diseases associated with myasthenia gravis includes systemic lupus erythematosus, ulcerative colitis, hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, pernicious anemia, rheumatoid disease, scleroderma, psoriasis, vitiligo, pemphigus, polymyositis, and dermatomyositis. History taking. Assess the duration and severity of muscle weakness. Grading of severity. Type 1 involves primarily extraocular muscles. Type 2A, mild and slowly progressive Spares respiratory muscles. Type 2B, weakness is more severe and rapid and involves respiratory muscles. Type 3, acute onset and rapid deterioration occurs. Type 4, severe generalized weakness. Inquire about respiratory symptoms such as autognia, which may indicate mediastinal mass, symptoms of pneumonia, respiratory failure, etc. Inquire about stress fatigue on arm adduction or upward gaze. Inquire about treatment, which may be choline esterase inhibitors, steroids, immunosuppressants, plasmapheresis, and history of thymectomy.
Plasmapheresis depletes plasma esterases and prolongs the effect of saxamethonium, mevacurium, ester-linked local anesthetics, remifentanil, esmolol, and other drugs that are metabolized by plasma esterases. Also inquire symptoms of autoimmune diseases associated with myasthenia gravis. Physical examination involves assessment of the airway, breathing, chest infection signs, muscle weakness, which can be demonstrated by asking the patient to chew a gum and assess if the muscles of mastication fatigues. As mentioned previously, Androphonium can be used to diagnose myasthenia gravis. Electromyographic stimulation of myasthenic patients reveals fate. Assess for signs of other autoimmune diseases as mentioned above. Important investigations include serum electrolytes. Hypokalemia can exacerbate weakness. Pulmonary function tests such as FEV1, FVC, and PFR. FVC should be more than two times the tidal volume to allow for cough. Assess glucose levels if the patient is on steroids and other specific investigations for associated autoimmune diseases. Options for anesthesia Regional anesthesia is preferred whenever possible. General anesthesia without neuromuscular blockade with or without epidural. General anesthesia with neuromuscular blockade is the least desirable. There's a conflict between the need for neuromuscular blockade versus difficulty using neuromuscular blockade and anticholine esterases. Optimizing outcomes. If severe weakness, consider plasma pheresis preoperatively. Avoid drugs that can exacerbate myasthenia gravis, such as aminoglycosides, quinolones, and non-depolarizing muscle relaxants. Avoid giving more choline esterase inhibitor than usual daily dose to avoid risk of cholinergic crisis. 1 mg of IV neostigmine equals 30 mg oral pyridostigmine. Be cautious with pre-op sedation, pre-medication with aspiration prophylaxis with or without steroid cover, rapid sequence induction if there is aspiration risk. Avoid neuromuscular blockade whenever possible. Inhalational anesthetics reduces neuromuscular transmission by up to 50% and may avoid the need for neuromuscular blockade. Propofol and remifentanil technique may allow avoidance of neuromuscular blockade. IV anesthetics have no clinical effect on neuromuscular transmission. Employ multimodal analgesia. Reduce opioid use as it can reduce respiratory reserves. Ester-linked local anesthetics may have prolonged action and increased toxicity with anticholine esterase therapy and plasma pheresis. Exacerbations of myasthenia may occur. Use minimum dosage for blocks. Emergence. Extubate fully awake with full return of baseline strength, evidenced by nerve stimulation or clinically by head lift lasting more than 5 seconds. Risk factors for requiring post-operative mechanical ventilation in patients with myasthenia gravis includes periodostigmine dose exceeding 750 mg per day, disease duration of more than 6 years, preoperative vital capacity less than 2.9 liters, coexisting COPD, upper abdominal surgery, blood loss more than 1 liter, and major body cavity surgery. Employ staged weaning from ventilation. Restart choline esterase inhibitor slowly at smaller doses. Initial dosage of neostigmine should be used under nerve stimulator control, starting with a 2.5 to 5 mg bolus and increasing if necessary with a 1 mg bolus every 2 to 3 minutes to a maximum equivalent dose to the oral pyridostigmine dose. Diagnose and treat myasthenic or cholinergic crisis early. Next, we move on to anesthetic considerations in patients with Lambert-Eaton syndrome. Also known as Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, comparing myasthenia gravis versus Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, LEMS. Pathology. Myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disease where antibodies are formed against the post-junctional acetylcholine receptor, characterized by muscle weakness and fatigability. In LEMS, Antibodies to voltage-gated calcium channels and to the associated protein synaptotagmin results in reduction in presynaptic acetylcholine release. The quantity of acetylcholine released from presynaptic nerve terminal of the neuromuscular junction is increased in myasthenia gravis and decreased 
in LEMS. Distribution of muscle weakness. In MG, there is generalized weakness, often beginning with ocular and bulba muscle involvement. In LEMS, weakness predominantly affects the proximal muscles. Leg weakness is more pronounced than in MG. Ocular and bulbar muscle involvement is uncommon. Effect of exertion on muscle weakness. In MG, weakness is worse on exertion and improves with rest. In LEMS, weakness improves on exertion and worsens with rest. Effect of tetanic stimulation on muscle weakness. In MG, weakness worsens with tetanic stimulation. In LEMS, weakness improves on tetanic stimulation. Sensitivity to muscle relaxants. In MG, there is reduced sensitivity to depolarizing muscle relaxants and increased sensitivity to non-depolarizing muscle relaxants. In LEMS, there is increased sensitivity to both depolarizing and non-depolarizing muscle relaxants. Effects of acetylcholine esterase inhibitors such as neostigmine and pyridostigmine on muscle weakness. These drugs significantly improves weakness in myasthenia gravis but only a slight to no improvement is seen in LEMS. Other features seen in LEMS not seen in myasthenia gravis. There may be autonomic dysfunction in LEMS. The patient may present with dry mouth with metallic taste, autostatic hypotension, impaired sweating, ptosis, urinary retention, constipation and impotence. About 60% of patients with LEMS have an underlying malignancy most commonly small cell lung cancer. Being a paraneoplastic syndrome, symptoms of LEMS improves with successful treatment of the underlying malignancy. Cerebellar ataxia, which impairs movement, speech and swallowing may occur in LEMS but not seen in MG. There may be depression or absence of tendon reflexes in LEMS. Important anesthetic considerations. Due to the pathophysiology of LEMS, muscle weakness improves with activity, unlike in myasthenia gravis. Two-thirds of cases of LEMS is associated with malignancy and this should be investigated. Muscle weakness may predispose to respiratory failure after anesthesia in patients with LEMS and they may require post-operative mechanical ventilation. Patients with LEMS are very sensitive to both succinylcholine and non-depolarizing muscle relaxants. Autonomic dysfunction may be present in up to 30% of patients. History. Assess for distribution and severity of muscle weakness. Muscle power improves with exercise. Neostigmine produces little or no improvement. Assess for symptoms of autonomic dysfunction as mentioned previously. Physical examination. Assess for severity and distribution of muscle weakness that may be reduced or absent lower limb reflexes. Assess for signs of autonomic dysfunction that may be impaired accommodation. Important investigations include serology for antibodies to voltage-gated calcium channels and synaptotechmin, chest x-ray and CT chest to assess for lung cancer, and EMG. Characteristic findings on EMG on low-frequency 2 Hz stimulation there is reduced amplitude, and on high-frequency stimulation, 50 Hz, there is increased amplitude. Optimizing outcomes in patients with LEMS. Regional anesthesia may be the best option. Counsel and prepare for possible post-operative mechanical ventilation. IVIG 2 gram per kg over 2 days improves muscle strength. Minimize the use of neuromuscular blockers. This may prevent the need for post-operative mechanical ventilation. If neuromuscular blockers are used, titrate carefully using nerve stimulator. Post-tetanic count is a better monitor than train of fall. Caution with myocardial depressants or vasodilating drugs due to autonomic neuropathy and risk of hypotension. Extubate fully awake with minimal weakness or proceed with post-op ventilation and weaning. These are my references. Thank you.